starting off with philately in uh, Germany, I like to introduce uh, the three major uh, news magazines that uh, they have, uh, which means that uh, the philately community is still alive and kicking in Germany and uh, very uh, detailed. Oh, I'm. <laughs> Uh, they're not just in the XX towns. They have clubs in uh, some like 200 towns. One other thing which probably everybody knows about is uh, the Michel uh, catalog. Some people pronounce it in North America, Michael, but uh, in Germany they're called Michel because the guy who started it in the 19th century, his name was Michel. So the Bund Deutscher Philatelisten has uh, 677 uh, member clubs. Uh, on top of that, I'm sure there are some other ones. So I just mentioned this catalog, which is a very uh, detailed. One other thing which is different than uh, in Germany to North America is that there's a lot of uh, special cancellations. You have them here too, but uh, here's just a page from uh, the small town where I used to live in Lüneburg, where they have uh, uh, different uh, cancellations well issued since 1937 but uh, for all kinds of events and every magazine for example has also an announcement of some special uh, cancellations that uh, are made available and uh, with the information where to contact and get those that's uh, the german post office that gives you the contact information how to get those special cancellations and uh, I thought of starting <clears throat> not with the Roman Empire or Adam and Eve, but uh, still with the time of the Holy Roman Empire of Germination, because they had already postal service. And uh, later than uh, uh, the Deutsche Bund that uh, preceded the uh, uh, German Empire, and that was from 1815 to 1866. And the main point I want to make is Germany is a young country. It's younger than Canada. So uh, having said that, uh, we go a little bit more into details. See, when you go on uh, Connect, which is a, a popular um, website for cataloging and for really also for exchanging stamps and get all kinds of information, uh, this comes up in uh, Germany. But there are subdirectories, and they look like this. So first, I thought maybe touching on each point for a minute or so. But uh, I thought we should stop before midnight. And uh, so I will uh, highlight a few items. But uh, just my point is, if you're looking for any rabbit holes, you find them here. There are lots of them around. OK, so the Roman Empire of German nation was from 962 to 1806. <clears throat> And uh, at one point, it also added then uh, the term uh, Natius Germanicae. So originally it was Sacrum Romanum Imperium. Anyways, it was multi-ethnic, multilingual. It covered a large area. That's why I kind of point this out here. And uh, the Tonan Taxis family, who were or are still are residing in Regensburg, that's why I put it on the map there, um, that was commemorated in 1990 with uh, stamps in uh, Germany, Austria, Berlin, Belgium, and also East Germany. So just as an example, also to see the, to show the extent of the time of the reach. Now, preceding the Ton and Taxis was something that's called the Metzger Post. There was a guild of butchers. They organized a cura meal with uh, their horses and uh, they obviously sold the meat not of the horses, but of other meat. But then uh, they carried also mail around. And that started in the 12th century and was active until 1637 when the Ton and Taxis got the uh, monopoly of that. And I just have down there a little town, even though that's in the Renaissance, but let's not bicker about it. And uh, the thing is here with the horn that announces the arrival of the uh, mail uh, well, we still have it today in all kinds of uh, um, postal insignia, the postal horn, and up there on the right is one of the German stamp from the 50s, the Posthorn series. The Ton and Taxis were also commemorated in uh, 1952 with a stamp by the Deutsche Bundespost, and they themselves also issued stamps. Now, they're still around uh, as a 
family. They're one of the richest families in Germany and the largest landholder in Germany. The castle is still in a town inside the town of Regensburg. Now, the, I just have here the line, uh, one uh, letter and uh, that uh, has one of the stamps, the uh, Drei Kreuzer, the three uh, Kreuzer letter uh, from 1852. And that uh, garnered uh, 105,000 euros in a recent, uh, in a very recent auction. So it's uh, interesting stuff. And this is not just a little timeline. <clears throat> the first stamp in uh, Germany or German countries was issued by the Kingdom of Bavaria, and then for, uh, all the other ones followed. And uh, year by years, and in several years, there uh, were several towns, countries that uh, also joined the Fed, let's call it. After all, in 1840, when Britain introduced it, it was a modern means of communication. And uh, the 19th century was a heady time, really. Uh, then uh, I mark here also Deutsches Reich in 1871, and then uh, come, uh, a couple other things that uh, issued then new stamps, whether the Memel, Danzig, Schlesisches Abstimmungsgebiet, Amerikanische und Britische Zone, Französische Zone, Alliierter Bereich, Deutsche Demokratische Republik, and so on. And I just mark here also a little bit uh, the wars that went on. 1848, revolution, revolutions all over Europe. And uh, shortly after that, uh, Bavaria issued the first stamp. Then there was another war in the Schleswig War, which was a war between Prussia and Denmark, followed again by the second one in 1864, where Prussia, in a way, uh, gained more military, uh, how shall I say, uh, expertise, which led to the War of 1870 uh, with France, and uh, which was victorious for the Prussian coalition and which resulted in the founding of the German Empire. And then the uh, uh, World War I, 1914, and then uh, another war. I just uh, list all that, that just to show that uh, the whole place is just soaked with blood and uh, um, the, gra the graves were commemorated in the stamp here in what was in 1994. But uh, also that in a way that a lot of things were related. We're all linked to each other. And that's reflected in the stamps. And one more time, going back to uh, history here, Deutscher Bund, up to 1866, you can see more or less the outlines what eventually was the German Empire, but at that time still with Austria. And uh, we get back to that map in a, a while. Here's uh, Bavaria. On, the, on that ma map, I just try to try to highlight then where the kingdom of Bavaria was at the time. And they had a little piece here called the Bayerische Pfalz. Uh, that's today not part of uh, the state of Bavaria in Germany. Anyways, first principality issuing stamp. Only five other entities had issued stamps before. And then uh, I found interesting, it's uh, uh, one Kreuzer, or one, uh, well, what would you call it, uh, a shilling. Um, they avoided uh, to show the sovereigns or the king's head on the stamp because uh, uh, of 1848. In 1848, many of the principalities uh, were under pressure and um, it looked like uh, well, a full-fledged revolution of all over Germany. Uh, the king, the Bavarian king was only then featured on the stamp in 1914. The early stamp was only valid within the kingdom, and then there was an agreement where, in, in one year later, 1850, with Austria for external mail. And a uh, little peculiarity, the stamp had to be attached to the top left of the letter. The stamp is pretty pricey if you want to buy it, but you also may end up uh, buying one of the forgeries of uh, Jean de Sperati. So uh, there are plenty of other items too. Now, the interesting thing with Bavaria is that uh, they were still issuing stamps all the way up to 1918, really, until the end of uh, uh, the German Empire. And there are plenty of stamps also around that have uh, overprints. Now, Volksstadt Bayern, Volksstadt is just a German Germanized word for democracy. So I would translate this as Republic Bavaria. It was in, uh, after 1918. 
once uh, the king abdicated and the emperor also. And Freistadt Bayern is just a name they gave themselves in later. And uh, then you have also Bavarian stems with the overprint Deutsches Reich. Freistadt is also a little interesting. Uh, this is a piece of trivia. Uh, today, there are three states within the Federal Republic of Germany that call themselves Freistaat. That's uh, Bayern, Sachsen, and Thüringen, Bavaria, Saxony, and Thuringia. Um, those early Bavarian stamps are also featured on uh, some of the first stamps of the Federal Republic, 1949. And uh, I think they're very attractive. They're beautiful. And uh, um, I love them in my collection. Going back a little bit more at those uh, early states, so we got uh, uh, German state of Prussia. Again, the map up there was the largest within uh, the confederation, you could say. And there's only kingdom since 1701. Uh, just to point out the three um, illustrious people, uh, Otto von Bismarck, who was really the architect of the German Empire in 1871, Friedrich von Steuben, who modernized uh, the American, the revolutionary forces in the American Revolution under uh, George Washington, and uh, was very instrumental there. And then Frederick Friedrich II, who was in the early 18th century, also very instrumental in bringing uh, Prussia to the state, to state of importance. There are a lot of uh, interesting tidbits with the whole you know, history when you look at uh, the history there itself. Anyways, I don't want to dwell too much on that one now. Württemberg, that's actually uh, the little corner in the southwest of Germany. And it's now part of the state Baden-Württemberg. And uh, the Kingdom Württemberg issues is done in 1851. And uh, it's also a relatively newcomer, 1805 only, at the time of Napoleon, because Napoleon was active in the early 19th century, reorganizing Europe. Württemberg issued rather the French military administration of the uh, zone, French zone in Germany after World War II also issued then stamps in the name of Württemberg. And there's a lot of other ones. So I just have here a potpourri of different uh, stamps, some uh, small ones, some large ones. For example, uh, somewhere is Bergedorf, um, Hannover, Lübeck. Lübeck, for example, is a town uh, at the time not that big, um, but uh, uh, always a relatively important port on the Baltic. And uh, Bremen, Hamburg. Oh, yeah, Hamburg. Okay, for some reason, I don't have Bergedorf here, but Bergedorf is, uh, uh, oh, no, it's a tiny area, just as part of Hamburg now. Anyways, let's go on to one uh, peculiar item there. There's an island in the North Sea, <clears throat> which was Danish, British in 1807, and became German in 1890. It had its own stamps. The first one was issued in 1867 with Queen Victoria on it. And it was in shillings, half a shilling in this case. And then the last stamp was issued in 1890. And there you have again uh, uh, Queen Victoria. And there are even two currencies, six pence and in 50 Fennish. And uh, um, kind of interesting. The background is that in 1890, Germany and uh, the British Empire uh, switched. Germ Germany uh, became Helgoland and Britain became Zanzibar, which was at that time part of a German colony. Anyways, that island was then used as a bombing target after World War II. And in the 50s, in the late 50s, the residents returned. It's now a very popular vacation spot. Tiny island, just actually the two islands. One is very rocky, the other is sandy. Deutsches Reich. There you have uh, the predecessor of the Deutsche Reich, you have to say, was a Norddeutsche Bund. So you probably have that uh, stamp somewhere too. And here in Self uh, Self Kreuzer, they use the currency Groschen, which is kind of interesting too. I mean, when I grew up in Germany, uh, we still refer to in Groschen. Groschen was equal, equivalent to 10 Fennish. And uh, five Finnish, we call it Zexa, which means a sixer. 
makes no sense. Anyways, uh, first time was issued uh, by the Norddeutschen Bund in 1868. Then uh, the empire was declared in 1871 uh, after the war uh, against France. And the first time was uh, issued in 1872. Now, um, the early issues... They are called uh, uh, small breastplate. It will come, the next slide will show that a little bit better. There's a small uh, breastplate and a large breastplate. And uh, the, in the early ones, the half groschen and the one groschen, uh, the color was not very distinguishable. So they changed it to more orange. So it's on the right here. And there was an issue a little bit later. Here's uh, the, uh, the, on the right, is uh, the large breast plate. And uh, the distinction is that this one has the coat of arms of Prussia in the middle. That's a major, a big one. And then the small one in, uh, right in the center there is from the Hohenzollern, which was a dynasty that governed the German empire. Uh, on the right on the bottom is a picture of that castle, which by the way, is in the Southwest of Germany, far from, uh, from uh, Prussia. And uh, so another little tidbit here that does not come out easily here is that uh, the small breastplate stamp or eagle has on top then a little uh, the crown, which is uh, the crown of Charlemagne. So it's all, you know, history is all present in those stamps. Now, here we go to another topic. Uh, Germany felt very... Uh, well, it was a Johnny come lately, and I felt I should get some uh, of the territory, some of the colonies, because everybody else had colonies. The British had colonies, the French had colonies, the Dutch had colonies, uh, the Spanish had lots of colonies too. So, anyways, um, and uh, they came up uh, then specific. They had uh, various adventurers who helped them. Uh, make uh, some trading posts on the African coast. And uh, in 1884, ending in 1885, was a, a conference in Berlin where 13 countries, including the US, uh, came together and agreed on how to divvy up Africa. And so uh, these are now the different uh, colonies listed here, German East Africa, uh, New Guinea, Southwest Africa, which is today Namibia. Uh, by the way, there's still a German um, contingent, German presence there. Um, then you got Cameroon, Togo, and the Pacific, uh, several islands. Uh, German New Guinea is now part of Papua New Guinea. And uh, the different islands, Samoa is now, I believe, American Samoa. China, there was a small colony established in uh, Kiajou. Um, that's actually uh, uh, the province of Shandong. And uh, the town is uh, called uh, Qingdao. And uh, you find still in China, uh, the popular beer is uh, from Qingdao, and it's Qingdao beer. And post offices were established in China and Tianjin. Tianjin and also Morocco, as mentioned earlier, and uh, Turkey. The little peculiarity I found uh, with the uh, um, stamp here from uh, German East Africa is that they used Heller. Now, Heller is a currency I only know from Austrian stamps, and obviously they used it here, and they used it, uh, yeah, they were no longer valid in Germany, and uh, since 1873, I didn't even know it was used in parts of Germany. And it was revived in East Africa for a short period and is a, a, a smaller part of a rupee, which was used in East Africa, which is today's uh, uh, Tanzania. Now, during World War I, German authorities issued stamps also in uh, different countries they occupied. And there was in Belgium, uh, uh, Russisch Poland, which was really... Uh, what is sometimes referred to as Congress Poland, well, Poland, and the bottom one there is uh, part of Romania. However, Germany was not victorious, but rather uh, lost uh, some uh, territories. There were also plebiscites in uh, uh, several parts of it. I kind of highlighted them. The Memel on the top right, 
Schlesian bottom right. Um, bottom left here is where the Saar is, or uh, Saarland. And there was this tiny spot where there's no plebiscite, or just Belgium uh, carved it out of Germany. And that area is called Open Malmedy. And then you had this uh, in uh, the Danish part, which, by the way, had, by 1815 was Danish all the way to Hamburg. So and what you see here, the green, that was Denmark. The, the history there, the border went back and forth, back and forth. So there was a, for that area, there was a plebiscite and um, people voted for Germany in this case. The interesting thing is like here with the, uh, now Memel did not have a, a plebiscite, but in Eastern Prussia, there was a plebiscite in some parts, here the Danzig and, uh, I should have marked that, and uh, the Southern part, which would we also re refer to as Western Prussia, and Marine Werder. So that has a ballot box here, and um, I guess the Angel of Peace saying that, and interesting was in French. Then Danzig, after World War I, was separated from Germany altogether and declared a Freie Stadt, a free city or free town. So that existed from 1919 to 1939, and is today Gdansk. And uh, the first stamps were here, the Germania with the imperial crown, and it just print. Then there's a Meme, this uh, top right, and this, <clears throat> today's uh, Klaipeda in uh, Lithuania. At the time, it had a majority German population. Again, uh, Germania with uh, overprint. Then uh, quickly the international administration, which was overseen by the French, uh, issued their stamp. Again, Mema, 30 Finnish. And then uh, once uh, the Nazis occupied it again, it was renamed Memeland. And then the said, yeah, Memeland is free. And that was in 1939. Um, and it has a little elk. So that's a symbol for Eastern Prussia. And then uh, also there are separate uh, stamps issued just with Kleipeda and Memel. Silesia, that's actually Upper Silesia. You probably can see the on the top. Uh, it's again a stamp, all in French. Well, not quite. There's one, uh, it said Oberschlesien. And then in uh, Polish, Gorny Slask, and uh, but Old Silesi. Um, whoever wants to collect those stamps, go for it. Uh, I just show this map because it's uh, such an incredible situation where parts where uh, there was uh, a plebiscite somewhere seated in uh, Czechoslovakia and so on. It just goes on and on. So the other area where there was a plebiscite. Well, it was occupied by France, 1920 to 1935. There was a plebiscite in 1935. You can see that here on the stamp for the Volkshilfe, which is uh, um, semi-postal. And uh, then uh, later, in, from 45 to 57, it had its own status, separate status from uh, uh, the rest of Germany. And uh, the last stamp issued in 1959, for example, uh, before becoming part of the Federal Republic of Germany again, you have the same design. It even says Deutsche Bundespost, but it's in uh, French francs. But the first uh, stamp in 1945 issued by the French was with Finnish, and it just says Zar. You will find stamps saying Zargebiet and some also just Zar. In the uh, um, 1920s now, uh, still a German empire. The interesting thing there is, is a very big rabbit hole is uh, the stamps that were issued for the inflation. On the left is a schedule of uh, the uh, um, postage, how long it was valid. So, for example, uh, this one was not bad. You have 20 Fennish to mail, to, uh, mail a letter from October 1st to May 5th, but it gets an hour shorter. Like uh, on here, the 10 million stamp was only valid for uh, well, 11 days, but that was not the end of it. 10 million, it's on the top right red, and then it goes uh, on to 30, 40, 50 
1 billion, 10 billion, 50 billion. And then uh, uh, they introduced a new currency. Anyways, yeah, it kind of uh, lasted. It started really in 1916 during the war, very slow, but it really took a, went to a crescendo in uh, 23. Zeppelin, um, now actually less should take over, um, or Oliver. And just to mention that there was, uh, it's one peculiar collecting area of Germany, and it goes back to 1898 when uh, Mr. Zeppelin, Friedrich von Zeppelin, founded the Gesellschaft zur Förderung der Luftver Luftschifffahrt. And a uh, couple of years after that, he kind of got uh, the Zeppelin working and uh, flying. And in 1930, they started their transatlantic service. But by 1937, they had the famous or infamous Hindenburg disaster in uh, Lakehurst, New York. And uh, interesting enough, if you uh, uh, look for Zeppelins, they have them uh, again, uh, again in Friedrichshafen, they, where the Zeppelins were at the time. And now in 2013, uh, Zeppelin NT, as uh, stands for Neue Technologie, is used for tourism. Who knew? Now we're in, uh, still in Deutsches Reich, and uh, um, in uh, 1933, uh, Hitler took uh, power and uh, the first Reichstag under the new regime, they also issued then a stamp showing uh, Frederick the Great. The interesting thing with him is Frederick the Great was all about rule of law, tolerance, and the military. The rule of law, there's some incident uh, where he lost a lawsuit and uh, a local miller wanted tolerance he was uh, issued decrees uh, that allowed more tolerance than any other principality in europe at the time um, maybe as a footnote here he was also homosexual and uh, the military he uh, did make it into a very powerful force within uh, within europe and i would say that's a black mark but that's uh, the point that uh, the nazis really take or uh, took and uh, try to emphasize. But uh, anyways, oh, by the way, he didn't even speak uh, uh, German well. His first language was French. Then uh, in the middle is the last stamp, uh, one of the last stamps issued by the Nazis. And uh, just uh, as an example, where they went, this is already in 45, but basically uh, a lot of places were no longer in German hands, but uh, they still called it Groß Deutsches Reich. Um, and uh, it's a semi-postal, so they needed obviously a lot of money because a six plus 14 finish. On the right side is uh, uh, a stamp that was already issued earlier in uh, before uh, 1933 with Hindenburg, but they changed it to the, have then a watermark with a swastika. And here's just a postmark from 1938, uh, Munich, Hauptstadt der Bewegung, capital of the movement. Because uh, um, Munich was always seen as kind of the uh, place close to the heart of uh, of Hitler. Now occupations. Now uh, obviously there are a lot of st uh, stamps also issued with um, overprints of occupied countries. So Russia, here, Soviet Union, they have a couple of overprints. Uh, Jersey, they uh, generated their own stamps. Uh, but all in English, jersey and postage. And the guy who engraved the uh, stamp made sure that in the top corners is a V, a V for victory. And uh, yeah, here's some uh, Estonian stamp like that. Uh, Theresienstadt was a concentration camp in Czechoslovakia and uh, was kind of used as a showpiece when visitors came to Germany and they would show them concentration camps that was one of the places they would show them and uh, so they had also a stamp for that I, here I made a little list with uh, about the Deutsche Post because on so many stamps pop up Deutsche Post so you have them for the allied, uh, uh, allied forces for uh, actually just for three uh, the British, American and Soviet, the Russian zone, 
they used in Deutsche Post. Then the issues where it's uh, British and American, the Soviet zone used a couple uh, years, 48 to 49. The early German, East uh, Germany, Deutsche Demokratische Republik, used also uh, Deutsche Post, but more by accident. Berlin used it, uh, the Berlin stamps, Deutsche Post, and then they changed the Deutsche Post Berlin in 1953, and then it became Deutsche Bundespost Berlin until unification and then no more Berlin. The uh, Federal Republic had a Deutsche Bundespost until 95, and then it changed it to Deutschland. And uh, there's also one small uh, blip here, I forgot to put it in here. At the end of uh, the existence of the East Germany, they also used Deutsche Post. Anyways, just the examples, it's a tri-zone. Uh, the postmark is from Greifswald, which is actually in East Germany. So that was used uh, throughout uh, three zones. The uh, British and American ones, they used this early on. Uh, the French had this one here in bilingual zone Francaise in the brief post. And it was in Finnish, yeah. This one was overprint, that's actually from the Soviet zone. And then here was later also called uh, Sowjetische Besatzungszone, Soviet zone. So um, after everything crashed in uh, May 1945, individual post offices and towns and uh, also small states issued their own stamp. Um, and then some very, very, very basic, like the one here from Alt Gohlen, or the one here from Wittenberg is very simple, actually. Fee, Gebühr, bezahlt means fee is paid from Finnish. Others used uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, the man that uh, was there in charge before and just crossed it out uh, in black. This is Kreis Glau, Schau. And then overprint here, and the uh, overprint in red reads, Blut and Tränen seine Saat. Sein Wirken war nur Missetat. Blood and tears, his seeds. His legacies were only criminal deeds. So that's the whole area. You can, uh, there's so many local uh, issues. Uh, unbelievable. East Germany, or as they called themselves, the Democratic German Republic. And uh, that's, that's the area without Western uh, sectors in Berlin. And uh, there are two stamps I just uh, show here because I show the pipeline that is now, I believe, uh, disconnected because that is uh, bringing oil from uh, oil and gas from uh, then Soviet Union to East Germany. So it would be from Russia to uh, Germany now. There's one uh, on the bottom here, a little cover that's kind of, the stamp is worthless. 15 Fanny, uh, but it's a nice, neat little uh, stamp about uh, the uh, oil production. The first stamp for East Germany was still called Deutsche Post, and it was really just an accident uh, because that was already designed before a decision was made to have a federal republic and to have a German democratic republic. Also, a little tidbit of interest for collectors is that there are some areas where there are bi bilingual cancellations. It's in the southeast corner, uh, well, southeast of Berlin, at least, an area which is um, a bilingual, a Zorbian language and uh, German. So uh, it's kind of uh, interesting. Berlin, uh, there were four sectors. Uh, obviously, the Soviet one, the Russian one, went to uh, the German Democratic Republic. And uh, there were early stamps issued with Stadt Berlin, but they were also uh, in, valid in the surrounding areas, which is uh, called uh, Brandenburg, or Mark Brandenburg. And then eventually for Berlin itself, the, uh, all Berlin, those stamps were used with a cancellation, with a overprint Berlin. Once that was over, um, you have uh, stamps, definitive uh, stamps issued by the Bundespost, by the Bundespost Berlin. So you get the same design. And uh, um, it's always interesting to go through 
let's say the 10 cent books and then find uh, stamps for Bundespost Berlin because the print was much lower than the print run for the Bundespost. Only show here this one here is the Deutsche, but the Europa Center. Uh, that at one point, this is now in the 1960s, was the tallest building in Berlin. Um, just a curious thing for me. Now, you may have seen this one, Not of uh, Berlin, zwei, uh, two Finnish tax. There was a mandatory surcharge, not in Berlin, but in the rest of Berlin. So they had to come up with the extra two Pfennig. There is a whole working group in Germany from the Bund Deutscher Philatelisten that just looks at that. And I just have here the printout uh, of uh, a page from uh, a German catalog where you can have, uh, uh, you know, one uh, would garner 1,500 euros if you get the right one and cancel uh, with uh, a gum 9,850 um, it's not bad. So the whole variations on those uh, available. And here's just an example of how it was used. Now we come to more recent times, Bundesrepublik Deutschland. I kind of highlight here, again, the impact of history. You have three recognized regional languages in Germany. Uh, Danish language up there in uh, Schleswig-Holstein. And you see here, the dots kind of uh, indicate more or less whether German minorities in Denmark and Danish in uh, uh, Germany. The Danish minority in Northern Germany has also a guaranteed seat in the regional parliament. The Sorbian um, culture was also celebrated in 2012 by a stamp in Germany. And as I mentioned, there's a bilingual, bilingual signs, everything. And then there's an also Frisian. Now Frisian, Frisian is only spoken by a couple of thousand people now in uh, Eastern Friesland. Uh, there are hundreds of thousands in the uh, Netherlands who speak Frisian. But anyways, there is a recognition of that language and there's a um, Frisian council in uh, Germany. Again, the, how the history impacts everything. I highlight again this one stamp where the uh, demographics of Germany are shown how it was in 1889, 1989, and then 2000. So in the 1980s and the 2000s, when you can see the impact of the two world wars, how that has uh, um, cut into the number of males, especially, you know, there's two spots here. Uh, and, um, and obviously those are the baby boomers. The other important step, I think, in Germany was the introduction of the euro, which is really uh, important for Europe in itself. And uh, um, the transition was no problem over there. Everything in Europe now. Unification, 1980, Europe was 1990. Everybody knows about that one. The opening was on November 9th in uh, Berlin, uh, Bornholmer Straße. And uh, you see the near the first cars coming through. Um, here, uh, eventually, then uh, people dared also uh, cracking the wall with sledgehammers and were successful with that in some cases. Um, I can tell you it was very hard because I tried it. Also. I was in 1990 there at the wall, not with a sledgehammer, just a small one. I could not get a piece. That was the best concrete you ever had. Anyways, unification was in uh, October 3rd. Stamp was issued for that with a German flag. And uh, also, um, I have to say, it's noticeable how the German flag now pops up more often. Um, it pops up anyways at uh, soccer events, like the World Cup, but many other events too. Now, with the unification, it was an interesting period because there was a currency uh, reform that the East German mark disappeared on July 2nd, and uh, the Deutsche Mark of the West became the currency also in the East. And at that period, then the stamps, there were still stamps issued. One uh, definitive uh, series, the one here with the left with the Albrecht's book and Meissen, 10 Finnish, that was already 10 West Finnish, 
and they called it Deutsche Post again, instead of Deutsche Demokratische Republik. And they issued also uh, various uh, commemoratives. One example is this one here about the new synagogue. It was called New Synagogue. Unfortunately, only the facade is standing. The back is all burnt down, and but they have uh, rebuilt parts of it. And it's now uh, a museum. Uh, includes, however, also an area for uh, Jewish worship. Originally, when it was built in 1866, it held uh, up to 3,000 people. Um, since 1998, uh, private mail service is legalized under certain conditions, and uh, that fell away in 2008. And now, just uh, as examples, there are dozens and dozens of uh, private posts, and they issued stamps. Some are okay, some are interesting. And to show you about the private mail services, this is what you have. Uh, oh, sorry, this is the one from uh, before World War I, which, as a matter of fact, I did not know until I prepared this presentation. And this is a partial list of the ones that exist now since 1998. So uh, whoever is interested in more information, here is uh, the list of a few uh, web links, um, some in English, some in German. I recommend to ger learn German or use the uh, Google Translate function. It actually works quite well. Interesting one is, for example, here, the, the Dutch site, uh, fvdeutschland.nl. They have a magazine about uh, Germany and German stamps, and it's uh, published in German. And das Ende.